hello guys welcome to our channel once more so today i want to quickly very quickly a very quick revision through math mechanics of the northwest mark 2022 right so we're going to be solving the last 15 questions uh again you know our mission and if you have to contact us that's the contact right down there on the screen let's dive right in i wish you guys all the best in your exams tomorrow you can actually use this work as a useful piece of revision before you write the exams and i think for every question you can actually just pause the video and then you know just read the question and try to solve it before you actually watch what i've done all right wish you all the best guys i hope you got this let's dive right in Hi guys, so our first question says the position vector of a particle P at time t is given by, so we have that, the speed of P when t equals 1 second is. Alright, basically to get velocities, you have to differentiate position vector with respect to time, so you actually have that position vector, that speed or that velocity would be, you differentiate this guy, you actually have uh, 2i, <coughs> come over here and differentiate this guy, you actually have 1 minus 2t, or that j, right? so you actually have now a speed will be the magnitude of course of this velocity so you come over you get the i and the j component squared right at that so the j component is actually one minus two t but remember that you're getting that speed at t equals to one second so you just put that one second there you have one minus two or that squared so you actually have root five so our answer is c okay so the maximum velocity of a particle when uh, which moves such that at t the velocity is given by okay of course when t equals all right to get maximum velocity of course you have to just get the vdt and equate it to zero if you want to really think about it think about this as maybe for instance you have y equals f of x right when is y said to be maximum of course when dy dx is zero in fact that's how you get to get the turning points right because you equate the derivative of y with respect to x to zero okay good so to get the maximum value of velocity the v dt must be equal to zero right velocity must not longer be changing at that particular maximum value with respect to time so let's differentiate here we actually um we're going to have 60 here minus 4 right this guy is a constant forget about it to differentiate this guy I actually have 3t squared minus 2t perfect so that's what we have here so that derivative must be zero so you actually have 60 minus 4 equals zero that's the i component right because if a vector is actually zero then both the i and j components are zero so you have the i component here to be c which implies that t is two thirds and then you get the j component equated to zero you actually realize that t is also two thirds or t is zero you have to ignore this t equals zero because you put in the i component you realize that uh, dv dt will be negative four right so it tells you that dv dt is not absolutely zero the i component still exists so this t equals zero is not absolutely true um doesn't make that velocity maximum so we actually have t equals to two thirds you put this guy both of the i and j components it actually gives you zero so the right value of t for which that um uh, velocity is maximum is c equals two thirds so our answer is b a particle moves in a straight line with a constant acceleration to meters per second squared initially is it is at rest the distance it covers during the first second of its motion is all right so let's get our data down get this down u equals to zero right acceleration is two meters per second squared so the displacement of a particle of course is ut plus have at squared right so um that's actually a displacement after time t <laughs> okay so we actually our reference here is actually the origin o right which is exactly when the particle was at rest so the distance the displacement of the particle is actually um after four seconds it's actually half into you know because this u is actually zero so we basically have half into the acceleration which is two times the time which is four seconds now this is a displacement from zero all the way to four seconds right so if we also want to get the displacement from zero all the way to three seconds we're actually going to have half a times t which is three so this is now displacement from zero all the way to four seconds that's four seconds later and this is a displacement three seconds later so if we want to get the displacement in the fourth second we'll basically take s4 minus s3 right so that displacement actually gives us 16 minus 9 which gives us seven meters so our answer is b A ball is projected vertically upward from ground level with speed this to move under gravity with g the maximum height it can reach is all right we can use equations of motion to solve this one right you must not use the, the equation for maximum height but if you use that that's fine all right uh, if you use the equation of maximum height that's given in projectiles you have to realize that your sine theta there would simply be 
uh, 1, right? Because the particle is projected vertically upward. So theta is basically just 90 degrees, okay? All right, but I'm going to use equation of motion to solve it. V equals to U plus 80, right? So we're actually going to have T to be V minus U on G. So uh, our V is actually 0 because at maximum I come to rest, our initial velocity is 15 divided by G. Since it's going up against gravity, G will be negative. So our T is 1.5. You come and you put in the displacement equation, S cross U T minus half A T squared. So you realize that... Um, Again, our u is 15, our t is 1.5 minus half, our a is 10, uh, our t is 1.5. So we get that distance to be 45 on 4, so our answer is a. The particle p moves with deceleration that where v is velocity, the motion is considered from a point a at which the speed is 2 meters per second. P comes to instantaneous rest at the point b the distance a b is all right so they've actually told us that this guy like that is deceleration which is negative acceleration of course so we actually have negative v dv dx that's acceleration right so uh, again acceleration can be dv dt but now i'm not going to use dv dt because this equation is not actually giving look at look at the format of the equation they've given you a velocity here and then they're asking you for a distance so you need an expression that relates velocity to displacement okay you don't actually need time here you, there's nothing that talks about time here right so you forgot about the time parameter all right so we actually have our acceleration like that but because it's deceleration that's why it's negative there it's equals to that so we can actually just uh, you know separate variables right so we actually have like that now if we separate these variables and then we decide to integrate we'll be integrating from 2 to 0 remember that initially it was traveling at 2 meters per second so the initial velocity is 2 the final velocity when it comes to rest remember that the particle is coming to instant instantaneous rest so the final velocity will be 0 so that's why i'm integrating from 2 to 0. now initially when the particle had the velocity of 2 the particle the distance is 0 right because once you calculate the distance it has covered from that time when the velocity is 2 all the way to when it comes to rest so from the time for or perhaps from the displacement zero all the way to uh, the time the particle comes to rest it has covered the displacement x okay so if we integrate now we're actually going to have okay since this is negative here i can actually switch this integration uh limits right from two to zero to from zero to two instead so the negative disappears and then we we can now integrate again look at this if i differentiate this denominator i actually have two v up here i just have v so what do i have to do i have to put two up there and i put half outside so if i put half outside i'm just going to have half the lean of the denominator okay so my x is basically half the lean of this denominator from zero to two so we put in those limits we're actually going to have half lean upper limit which is eight divided by lower limit which is four so our answer is half lean two so answer is d A particle is projected with speed 20 meters per second at an angle alpha to the horizontal given that the time of flight is 2 over 3 seconds and that g is then the angle of projection is given by okay so here <laughs> don't worry that the answer is already demonstrated on the screen but let me just do the working all right i just forgot to animate this so that it does not appear like that all right so yes i appear in all our ones all right i hope you just follow up right you gotta have the time to go back and then you know edit and then start animating again all right so we actually have the horizontal uh, component of the velocity will simply be 20 equals alpha right i've just not drawn the diagram vertical component will be 20 sine alpha this is paper one right you have to be you have to know these things maybe by heart really so your time of flight is basically 2u sine alpha over g so we're assuming that the plane of projection uh the plane from where the particle is projected is the same plane to where maybe for which the particle lands okay it does not overshoot that plane of projection all right because if you overshoot this will not be the time of flight so we actually have 2u sine alpha on g so our sine alpha will just basically be our gt over 2u so our sine alpha now is 10 right that's our g what's the time of flight is 2 over 3 what is our u our u is 20 so we multiply that by 2 you actually have 40 so our sine alpha is basically 1 over 6 so alpha is sine inverse of 1 over 6 so our answer is d Uh, 42. ABCD is a, rectang a rectangular plate of mass for m kilogram. Particles of masses this and that are placed at B and C respectively. The distance of the center of mass of the system from AB is... Alright, so since we are looking for the center of mass from this AB, now we are basically talking about Y bar, right? So, uh, our Y bar will just be basically just get each of those masses you multiply them by their center of masses right from ab 
or the center of the uh, center of gravity from AB divided by the sum of all the masses in the system. That's really it. It's as simple as that. Even for the X bar, right, you do the same thing. Sum of the masses multiplied by the or perhaps each mass multiplied by its center of gravity from you know this E D line if we're getting X bar instead right divided by all the masses sum of all the masses so again let's get it each of their moments so you actually have 4m the 4m mass is actually remember that the 4m mass is actually the mass of the whole the rectangular plate itself and that mass is actually going to act from the center right so this is the point here we want to get the distance from a b it will just be half of this 4a here so from here to here will just be 2a that's why i'm taking 4m times 2a plus now we get the another mass the other mass will be this guy at c so the mass at c is actually 3m from a b what is the distance of this mass from a b is 4a so i take 3m times 4a plus now the next mass will be this 5m but it's already at a b so what's the distance of a b zero because the, that guy is already on that line a b so divided by the sum of all the masses the mass of the rectangular plate the mass of the, the at c the mass at b so uh, we actually have y bar to be 20a right m over 12 m so we actually have 5 over 3 a so our answer is c all right a solid is formed by rotating the region bounded by the curve y the x-axis and the line x goes to once about the x-axis the x-coordinate of the center of the solid does form is okay i must admit i was stunned by this question all right but to get that you know centroid the x the x coordinate of the centroid of you know a solid of revolution that's generated is basic you have to apply this formula right now generally to get the centroid of a, of a curve is basically the integral from a to b of x y i'm talking about the x coordinate of the center right now x y with respect to x divided by the integral of y with respect to x now if you are getting the x coordinate of the of the maybe of the solid that's generated from rotating the curve about the x-axis then you basically have to multiply up and down by y right instead of x y now it goes to x y squared divided by y squared okay but i just realized i just realized that this question was actually supposed to be y equals to x squared because i actually solved it the parameters i was actually supposed to sketch the graph so that i show you where we are rotating now it actually tells you that between the x axis and the line x equals to two here um they've not given you the original another point they've not given you another point because if it's x squared then the, the graph just goes through you know the origin right so you actually have that portion from the origin all the way to x equals to 2 and they are rotating that portion about the x-axis this thing this is it's actually supposed to be x squared here but i solved it using this x cube so uh, that's why there was no answer i just realized now as i'm talking now that it's supposed to be x squared if you do it with x squared you actually have an answer all right so i'm just going to solve it with the x cube and then if you understand you try it out with the x squared and then you get your answer here all right so you we are going to be using this formula so now we will be integrating let's do this first integral up here 0 to 2x y squared respect to x so what's our y squared of course our our y itself is just x cubed so we square that we actually have x to the power 6 right multiply by x so we actually have x to the power 7 if we integrate that we actually have 1 over 8 x to the power 8 put our limits we have 32 now the second integral is from 0 to 2 y squared respect to x so our y squared again would be x cube or that square which is x to the power 6 so if we integrate that we actually have 1 over 7 x to the power 7 from 0 to 2 so which gives us 128 over 7 so our x bar is actually this first integral divided by the second integral which is 32 over that so we actually have our x bar to be 7 over 4 that's why i actually have an answer as known right but if you actually use y squared here i just realized i i, I copied this wrongly this was supposed to be y equals to x squared so if you use that you're actually going to have an answer okay All right, the force this acts on a mass displacing it from the point this to the point that the work done by f on the mass is all right basically work done is basically displacement times the force right so force times distance moving in the direction of the force so how do we get the displacement here since i'm moving it from this point to this other point it really is just dealing with vectors so you get the final displacement the uh, position vector minus the original position vector right that's the displacement vector you would get so the displacement vector is actually negative 3i plus 2j now you get that displacement that vector you dot it to the force because again work done is force times distance but then since work done is a scalar that multiplication is actually a dot product okay moment is force times distance but then because moment is a vector it's force times perpendicular distance so it's a cross product there right so our work done here is 
uh, the displacement vector is negative 3 2 dot the force which is 2 negative 4 so if we dot those two we actually have negative 6 minus 8 which gives us negative 14 newton meters so our answer is a In an, elast an elastic spring of natural length A and modus velocity lambda, the length of the spring when the truss in it is slammed down for is. Okay, so let's just do a bit of analysis. Young's mode is stress over strain, but stress is force over area, strain is extension per unit length. So Young's mode is FL over AE. So we actually make F the subject. We have e, e, e A times small E over L. Now, in engineering, the product of the Young's modulus of a material and, and its cross-sectional area gives you modulus of elasticity. Now you do that in physics, but we just want to, you know, just show you what happens in math mechanics. So uh, in math mechanics, we no longer use Young's modulus. We now rather use lambda, which is modulus of elasticity of a material, right? So uh, let's go again into physics where we actually have F to be K E. Now, if we if we actually you if you look at it. This is E here. This is also E here. Now this K must be lambda on L. So you actually come here and that's why I'm saying K is lambda on L. Now because in math mechanics, sometimes they'll give you modulus of elasticity and they'll ask you to calculate the spring constant of a material. So the modulus of elasticity divided by the original length of the material simply gives you the spring constant. Okay. So our work done is actually half KX squared, right? That's in math mechanics. Well, that, that's in physics actually, right? Because we actually have work done to be half kx squared or the elastic potential energy that is stored in a stretch material. Now, if we actually realize that k is lambda on L, you realize that we can actually have work done now in mass mechanics to be half lambda x squared over L, right? So again, those are just tiny, tiny things. Everything in yellow, you have to take note of it. Everything in yellow. So our f is lambda e over L, right? That's what you use in mass mechanics. So um, our extension, make extension of the subject, you actually have FL over lambda, right? So our F, which is a truss in it, is lambda on 4. Our L, original length of the material is just A. Lambda is lambda because it's modulus of elasticity, of course. So our E is E over 4. Now they are asking you the length of the material when the truss is lambda on 4. The length would simply be the original length plus the extension. And this is the extension we have calculated here. So that length will basically be the original length which is A plus that extension which is A over 4. So the length is 5A over 4. Our answer is A. A smooth sphere of mass 4 kg moving with speed 5 meters per second strikes a wall normally and rebounds from it with speed 3 meters per second. The loss in KE due to the impact is... All right, so loss in K is basically K initial minus K E final, right? But since there's only one moving body here, the ball, the ball is not moving. So our K initial is just the kinetic energy of the ball. So there were two particles moving. The K initial will be there, half mv squared, um, half mu squared plus half mu squared of the other guy, right? Good. So um, now we have just one guy moving. So the kinetic energy, change in kinetic energy will be basically half m, then u squared minus v squared because there's only one guy moving. So... Uh, we actually have half, m is 4, 25, because the u is 5, right? So square you have 25 minus uh, 9, because the initial velocity was 3, the final velocity is 3. So you actually have 32 joules of energy is lost. So our answer is C. A car of mass 1000 kg is moving along a horizontal road against a resistance of that. The power of the engine is 16 kilowatts. When the speed is v the value of v is all right so we actually have if the car is moving then of course the force from the engine minus frictional forces would be equals to ma right newton's second law so we actually have um the force from the engine you can express that as power over velocity this is a very very important formula in math mechanics force from the engine is power over velocity which is equals to frictional force now this is when the force from the engine just balances out you know the the frictional forces right so you don't actually have a change in velocity so there's no acceleration on that particle right good so we actually have v now to be the power over that frictional force so our v is that so our v is 40 meters per second our answer is c The figure shows a particle of weight 30 newtons pulled across a rough floor by a force of 30 newtons applied at an angle of 
alpha to the horizontal given that tan alpha is that mu is that g is that the associated particle is all right so again we just need to resolve right so if you resolve the, the force like is acting like that so the, the horizontal component because the particle is moving horizontally so we need the horizontal component of that force which is f cos alpha okay so if we get that f cos alpha we have to subtract frictional forces from it because you are pulling like this frictional force will be acting in the opposite direction so we subtract frictional force because to ma again newton's second law basically so you have um, our oscillation therefore to be f cos alpha minus mu mg divided by m because frictional force is just mu times mg right so we have um, our a to be 30 cos alpha because of course the force is 30 so cos alpha minus mu is what 1 over 5 so our mg is 30 so we actually have that over a which is uh, over m which is 3 so we actually have our a to be now 3 here 10 so we have 10 cos alpha 3 here 2 times because 1 over 5 times 30 is 6 so we basically have 2 there so again if tan alpha is 3 over 4 sine alpha must be 3 over 5 and then goes alpha be 4 over 5 basically trigonometric you know tri triplet or pythagorean's um triplet so we actually have a to b come back here 10 kawa cos alpha is 4 over 5 minus 2 so we actually have our e to be 6 meters per second squared our answer is b The events A and B are such that P of A is that P of B is that P of A union B equals 3 over 4. And then what is P of A given B? All right. So we actually have P of A intersection B to be P of A plus P of B minus P of A union B, right? So we actually have P of A intersection B to be P of A is 3 over 5. So P of B is 1 over 4 minus P, a, P of A union B is 3 over 4. So we actually have 1 over 10 for our P of A intersection B. So P of A given B is actually P of A intersection B divided by P of B, right? So P of A intersection B is 1 over 10. P of B is 1 over 4. So our answer is 2 over 5, which is D. Which of the following is equivalent to P of A prime intersection B? All right. This, we let me do a bit of work here. So consider this diagram over here, right? So you actually have A intersection B that's common, A union B that's common, right? So A prime is just everything except A, right? So that's why you have this area that's white. So what we are shading, we are shading what these sets represent. So the set A intersection B actually represents the intersection of a and b which is this so we shade it then a union b we shade it a prime we shade a prime so all of this that is actually a prime the guy that is white is a okay so this a intersection b prime so we shade that so a itself this is our a here intersecting b prime now b prime will be everything except b so the intersection of a and b prime Will just be pua without the intersection right good and then you actually go on and so forth and so forth and so forth so you can actually have time to pause this video here and then just study this diagram it's very important really but i'm just going to do a few things here so p of a prime intersection b just come to our diagram that i've drawn here a prime intersection b look at this a prime intersection b so you go to b right you shade b so we have shaded b now you shade a prime to so a prime shaded will be everything except a all of this outside area so the intersection of b and a prime will just be this pure b here all right now what do you notice how do i define this how do i define this shaded portion this shaded portion is actually p of b without the intersection of a and b so i actually have just p of b minus p of a intersection b so a prime intersection b is p of b minus p of a intersection b there will be a intersection b prime a intersection b prime will just be p of a minus p of a intersection b so that's what they ask in this question what is p of a, inter a prime intersection b is just simply p of b minus p of a intersection b and then you can actually go on to study many others so our answer here is just c right but we can actually go on to study others because we actually have p of a union b prime you come over here a union b prime this is it how do you write that in uh, probability language because it's not enough to know this what you would actually use to calculate is how you can write this out good so look at this i want to define this region that is shaded like this a this is my a here all of it union b prime so b prime will be everything except b now how do we describe this region that we have shaded 
in mat in um, probability language like this now you can actually try to describe the one that is first of all not shaded look at this small place that is not shaded this place that is not shaded is simply p of b minus p of b intersection a this is a, this small portion that is not shaded like this is p of b minus p of b intersection a because p of b intersection a is shaded so that's why i'm taking p of b then i subtract this shaded portion from it right now if i take one minus this this uh, the, the description of this place that is shade that is unshaded, and I'll get the place that is shaded. You, you understand? So because this place that is shaded is actually P of B minus P of B intersection A. So now get the place that is on that is shaded will now rather be one minus all of that, right? So that's why I have it there. So you have P of A intersection A prime intersection B prime. Come over here. This is A prime intersection B prime here. So you realize that it's just everything except P of E or b right so a or b is actually this portion that is that is shaded like this you have a you have b and then you have their intersection which is simply defined from p of a or b so you have nothing there so you have simply have one minus p of a union b and p of a union b is simply p of a plus p of b minus p of a intersection b that's why i simply said one minus p of a plus p of b minus good so you can go on and then you define another ones like i'm right